You are Hello, on. everyone, and welcome to our partner showcase, Braille Blaster 2024, anticipating exciting updates as you're making your way into our webinar today. You will see a poll question pop up. We're, we're wondering where who you are, where you're from, and um, a little bit about what experience you have with Braille Blaster. So just take a couple of minutes to answer our poll. And it should pop up right now. I am your host today, Amanda Dennis, and with us, we have Willow Freeman. We have a couple of ground rules while you're making your way in. The first is to please type your questions in the chat. There will be no ACV REP credits for this partner showcase, and closed captioning will also be available. So the first question that we have for today in our last poll is, how long have you used Braille Blaster? Never, less than a year, one to three years, four to six years, or more than six years? It's amazing to think that it's been available for more than six years. I know, <laughs> isn't it? It is a trumpet blast for Braille. That was the old slogan. Was it though? Yes. What's the new slogan? Um, I you know we're workshopping it. Okay. I don't want to tie us to anything. You know, you could give people a little bit of a preview to what that might yeah. look like, though. You want to give a little sneak peek there, Willow? Uh, Braille blaster blasting down barriers to Braille. Nice. All Amazing. Right. We have about 85% of the people that have responded. So how about if I end the poll and I share the results? Amanda, do you have those to share with everybody or would you like yes, to I do. go through these? All right. So it looks like about 20% of you are joining us from the Northeast, 34 from the Southeast, 11% from the Northwest, 9% from the Southwest, uh, and then we have a 23% representation from the Midwest, 2% uh, from a U.S. territory, and 2% internationally as well. So welcome, everybody. We're thrilled that you're joining with us today. Um, it looks like a lot of you guys heard about this webinar either through our email chain or through the APH website, and that a majority of you guys are teachers of the visually impaired, and about 2% are ONM instructors. We have assistive technology specialists and braille transcribers with us, as long as as well as rehabilitation professionals and a couple of people who do something else. Um, as far as the braille blaster and people's experience with using it, 32% said that they've never used it. 20% said that they have for less than a year, uh, about 32% for one to three years and four to six years for 12% of our audience. And we have about 5% for more than six years. Alrighty, so we're going to start off our webinar today. As I said earlier, uh, I'm your host, Amanda Dennis, and we are joined today by Willow Freeman, who is the Braille Technology Product Manager from APH. So Willow, take it away. Yes, thank you. Thanks. And welcome, everyone. So glad to have you all here. I um, want to start off by just making sure everybody knows how to get Braille Blaster, um, how to check it out. So the first thing is you can go to BrailleBlaster.org. So just BrailleBlaster.org. You don't even have to bother doing the www.BrailleBlaster.org. That's how much we care about efficiency. We took that right out of the URL. So BrailleBlaster.org. If you type in Braille Blaster into your favorite search engine, uh, it'll be the top result. We are the we are Braille Blaster. We are the only Braille Blaster. Uh, I'm glad we got dibs on that name. Uh, and so that gets you to the website. And then from there uh, is the download button. You'll want to activate the download button. And then that will show you uh, Braille Blaster. And there's a stable channel and a beta channel. 
and it's just this radio button at the top. So you can select stable or beta. The betas get updated a lot more frequently. So we actually will elevate something to a beta and not necessarily move it to stable. So we like to, we like to make sure we get new features out there so they can be tested. But unless there's like enough improvements and we're sure about the stability, we will not push it to stable. Um, but so you'll probably want to stay on the stable branch and there's a version for Windows, Mac, Linux, and a universal version. So if you're on Windows, Windows is definitely the best version. It has the most compatibility. Uh, and then there is a Mac version and a Linux version. And then this universal version, part of the idea behind here is notice, so Windows, Mac, and Linux, those are all installers. So it needs to install on your computer. And installing on your computer means admin rights. Not everybody has admin rights on their computer. And we update, we update fairly frequently, and it can be a pain to have to go ask your IT person to approve a new install. So the whole idea behind this universal version is you can download this, and it's just a zipped folder. So you download this zipped folder, you extract it, and then it has all the versions in it, and you just run the one that's relevant for your operating system. We had the question come through the chat, is Braille Blaster free? Yes, Braille Blaster is free. So it is a free Braille transcription program from APH. And we'll get into more about it as we proceed. Um, and if you have any questions uh, for the chat, you know, please drop them in. I love getting a chance to answer ad, uh, questions as they come in the chat because I don't want folks to be confused. And if you have a question, there's a decent chance that other folks have that question. Um, but I want to make sure I get to those. Another question came through the chat. So you can you can send it to us only, so hosts and panelists, or you can send it to everyone. It's probably better to send your question to everyone and then that way folks can see what questions are being asked. But the question was asked, admin rights are needed because BB is, is open source, correct? Uh, Braille Blaster is not open source. So at the moment it's closed. We may one day make it open source, but for now it is it is closed. But that's not why you need admin rights. Uh, most things you install will require uh, admin rights. Um, IT departments are very strict. And we are recording this and we'll make it available later. All right. So the prerequisite skills for use of Braille Blaster are, you do need to be familiar with Braille. Um, it's very easy to use. We're gonna get into how you use it, but it's not a license for people that don't know Braille to start making Braille. You know, we wanna democratize Braille as much as possible. We wanna make it as easy as possible for people to make Braille, but you need to at least have some familiarity with Braille in order to use Braille Blaster um, if you're gonna be giving it to a student. Now, if you wanna use Braille Blaster as a tool to learn Braille for yourself, have at it. You don't need to know Braille to do that. But if you're gonna be giving it to a kid, you owe it to that, that student to know Braille yourself so that you know they're getting quality materials. Um, it's really important that you, you do that. And there is no opening code because we're not doing um, continuing education credits for this webinar. All right, so we're getting a ton of questions in the chat and I, I did this to myself, um, but these are relevant questions and it's good to address them. So uh, Cindy asked that sometimes she notices that Braille Blaster closes or freezes while working and wants to know why. Um, so the big thing is if you have not updated Braille Blaster in a long time, um, we are constantly addressing the stability and trying to address issues. So we've just put out our first update to the stable branch in a long time. And that's the whole reason we're doing this webinar is we wanna make sure folks get this latest version, get this version 2.1.3 uh, that is available right now. 
basically we had Braille Blaster 1.0, then we had 2.0, now we're at 2.1. And the whole idea of 2.1 is to combine the kind of the best features from uh, 1.0 and 2.0. Uh, and the stability is better than it's ever been. We're still doing some cleanup from this massive overhaul, uh, but uh, we're in a really good place where it's easier than ever for us to uh, apply these updates. All right. So that's how you get Braille Blaster. Go ahead and download it. We also have a list of frequently asked questions, uh, and these are still relevant. And we have uh, documentation uh, for using Braille Blaster. You know, one big key about using Braille Blaster is, and this is something we can't really do much about. Like we try to address it as much as we can, but you know, Braille translation is, it's complicated, but it's fairly straightforward too. You know, the computer can basically handle it. There's some things that come up here and there that you need to be aware of. Um, but it's not that complicated from the user's perspective of Braille Blaster. However, formatting is complicated. So Braille formatting is very complicated and Braille Blaster attempts to handle as much of that, um, as much of that as it can, but there's definitely a learning curve to using all the styles that are available in Braille Blaster. So, We'll get into that a little bit today, but the big thing you'll want to be aware of is Formats 2016, which is the, you know, available at brailleauthority.org. I've got it here on the screen and I'll put it in the chat, but this is the rules for Braille formatting available from the Braille Authority of North America. If you're not familiar with these rules and you're making Braille, you probably want to familiarize yourself with these rules. Braille Blaster does everything it can to handle these things for you uh, as much as it can, but you you want to be able uh, you want to be able to address them yourself. We're getting a ton of questions in the chat. Um, so students, do students need to be fluent in Braille before using Braille Blaster? Uh, no. So the first thing I'll say there is Braille Blaster is not really designed for students, not, not younger students. So if you have a student that's on the younger end, they probably aren't the right audience for Braille Blaster. Um, if it's an older student and you're teaching them to be independent and to make their own Braille, uh, that's a, thing, a great thing to do, but they probably need some fluency in Braille uh, before you start doing that. Um, and Braille Blaster is accessible, uh, so they should be able to use it. If you're noticing issues with embossing, thank you for letting us know. We will review that. We test embossing with every update and haven't noticed issues on our end, uh, but we will check it out. And I'll also show how you can uh, I'm also going to uh, show you how you can uh, report issues with Braille Blaster. All right. So BrailleBlaster.org is how you get the program. And then the other thing you can do is you can go to APH.org and we actually have a Braille Blaster page on Braille Blaster or on APH.org. And from there, you can get back to the main page. Now, I noticed some folks typing in with like very specific issues to their experience using Braille Blaster. We're not gonna be able to get to all of those today. Um, and so the big thing I would ask folks to do, not everybody does this, and we really, really appreciate it when folks do take advantage of this, is we have a feedback form. So it's on braillablaster.org under feedback. So you put in your name, you put in your email. Here's a look at all of my emails. <laughs> Let's give my personal email out to everyone. Um, so <laughs> there's a list of all the emails and then you can put bug or feature request. And so once you select bug or feature request, then you can put the subject and then you can describe the issue that you are having. 
Um, and so just give us as much information as you can. Like, so the person who wrote in that they were having issues with embossing, uh, it would be really helpful to just say like, hey, I updated to this version and I'm trying to use my page blaster and it's not working and I'm getting some poor embossing and here's what's happening when I try to emboss. And then we can take that feedback and then incorporate that in a future version. Um, the last thing on this feedback form is it says, what is one plus eight uh, in my case? So those numbers are randomly generated. Um, it'll be basically any number between I think one and nine. But the idea here is it's in place of a CAPTCHA. If you're familiar with CAPTCHAs, they're a way to stop uh, basically robots from being able to fill out your form and spam you with all kinds of messages. So instead of having a CAPTCHA, which are really often inaccessible and kind of a pain to use, we just have this very simple math problem. And the robots can technically get around it, but most of them don't bother. <laughs> So the whole idea is just being slightly inconvenient so that the the robots don't try to don't try to spam us with messages. Uh, and if you have any issues with it, you can also email cs at aph.org. Um, customer service can help with Braille Blaster. Um, the amount of help that we can give is limited. Uh, the main thing we like to do is like just take down the feedback and then share that back with the development team. And the whole reason like we can't help a ton with Braille Blaster through customer service is we're already investing a lot of money into Braille Blaster and it's expensive um, and it's free. So it's this free program and we can't we can't pour a lot of additional resources into it uh, by offering extensive customer service on a free product. Um, we, you know, we have a great customer service team and they love to help folks, um, but there is a limit to how much guidance they can give a person uh, who's using Braille Blaster. So the feedback forms your best way to let us know about an issue. And then once you fill it out, you can click submit. Before we move on, I also want to make sure folks are aware of Braille Zephyr. So it's also available through BrailleBlaster.org. And Braille Zephyr is a, Braille, a BRF editor. So it basically mimics like a Perkins Brailler, but digital. Uh, it's similar to Perky Duck, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. Um, it has a great bell warning, which we advertised three times uh, on the uh, list of features. And that was a much requested feature when it first came out. There were very passionate users that insisted we should have a bell warning. Uh, and that's also available for Windows and Linux. Though, one thing I want to point out is Braille Blaster is a Java program, and so it requires Java in order to work. Uh, if you install Braille Blaster, it will automatically install Java. So we install the version of Java that we want to make sure you have, and that gives you the ability to run the, the program. Braille Zephyr does not do that. So Braille Zephyr just installs itself. If you've already installed Braille Blaster, you should be fine because Braille Blaster will have installed Java. You'll be set, you'll have everything you need. And then when you install and run Braille Zephyr, it should just use that same version of Java and everything else uh, should work. And finally, we have a contact us page. Uh, you can join our mailing list so you can hear about the latest announcements. And then it directs you to some other things. and also gives our customer service information. And lastly is the donate page. So because it is free, uh, we do appreciate uh, folks, if you use Braille Blaster a lot, uh, donations um, are always appreciated. So if you're able to do that, it is much appreciated. All right. So that's a bit of the basics about how to get Braille Blaster, uh, making sure you're on the latest version, um, how to report issues that come up, how to find documentation, and, and all of those little things. And with that, we will get to the next question. One second. All righty. Our next poll question is, how often, what do you uh, use Braille Blaster for? 
Yeah. How? Sorry, my fault. Okay, how sorry. often do you use Braille Bluster? How How often do you use Braille Bluster? Never, daily, weekly, or monthly? And I see Jay. You asked, are more people using BB versus Braille 2000 or Duxbury? <laughs> and that is actually one of our poll questions. So we want to know the answer to that too. Uh, Duxbury traditionally is the most popular uh, when we've asked folks, um, and and I think that'll remain true. Uh, it's definitely very popular, but we're, we're always happy to hear what folks are using. And I would I would like to apologize um, because I started the poll and then I thought you guys were changing the question. So I ended it and it took me a few moments to figure out how to relaunch it. But we have active participation. So appreciate it. Did you um did you see the question about the integration of NIMAS files and the reliance on LibLui to enhance the creation of educational materials for blind, blind students? In other words, yes. how does Braille Blaster integrate with that? Did you see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. And we're gonna get into that as a part of our demo today. But they're asking about NIMAS files and LibLui. So if you haven't heard of NIMAS files. NIMAS files are available through the NIMAC. So the NIMAC is a, uh, it's basically a collection of textbooks and they're in a format that is meant to be difficult to access. So they're put in a format uh, basically called NIMAS XML. And the whole idea is there's no reader that just opens NIMAS XML files. And the reason there's no reader that opens NIMAS XML files is because textbook publishers don't want to create a file that people can use to pirate their textbooks. But it is a great file type for Braille. And so it's it's a, it's a great file type for lots of things, but for our purposes, it's a great file type for Braille. And so we can open NIMAS XML files. And while we don't display them to you as a textbook, so you can't use Braille Blaster for piracy, uh, for example, what we do is we take all that markup so all the styles inside the file, and we use that uh, to create the Braille formatting. And it's that process that is the best thing that Braille Blaster does. The number one thing that Braille Blaster does is take a file, take the styles within that file and convert them for Braille. The whole idea is hopefully you have a good file and we'll need to touch it the least amount possible inside Braille Blaster to finish it. And so that's kind of the goal that we're moving toward is like just being able to get as much information out of the file, uh, convert it for Braille, and leave the least amount of work for you to get that Braille to a student. A lot of folks are putting in their, their answers in the chat. Thank you for that. And we have some poll results to share with you guys too. So how often do you use Braille Blaster? About 35% of the attendees said never, 19% said daily, 27% said weekly, and 18% said monthly. That's great. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and run Braille Blaster. And we have like a, a super tight security at Braille Bla or at APH. And so Braille Blaster will actually take us a moment to run. As far as we know, we're the only place where this happens. So if this is happening to you, let us know because I would love to know if it's happening to other people so we can fix it. Uh, at the moment, it's not a high priority because it only happens to us and basically only exists to embarrass me during webinars. Uh, so just let me, let us know if this, uh, ever happens to you where it runs very slowly on startup. Ah, Deborah, thank you. It happens to you as well. So good. Thank you. I hate it, but <laughs> we had no idea if it happened to anyone else. Uh, and so thank you for confirming. Now we can make that a high priority to fix. Um, all right. So what I've done is I've actually restarted Braille Blaster. So it is a fresh, it's a fresh uh, start. And 
So one thing that happens the very first time you run Braille Blaster is it's going to say Braille Blaster first run, and it's going to give you a number of options, and it's going to ask you to fill these options out. And I'd like to run through those together. So it's a real basic interface, and then it just says check automatically for updates, and you can choose yes or no. So this, I think yes is the correct option. And so the idea is you select yes, and then every time you run Braille Blaster, what it'll do is it'll basically ping our server and it'll find out if there's an update. If there's an update, it'll then tell you an update is available. It's channel specific. So like I was talking earlier where we update the beta all the time and we update the stable only rarely. Um, if you're on the stable channel, you, it'll only check the stable channel and so you're not going to hear about all these beta updates since you don't care about the beta updates. You'll only hear about the stable updates. But it's totally worth doing. If you would rather not, that not happen, like if you have a data cap or just very slow internet or something like that, you can just say no, and then you can manually check um, when Braille Blaster has an update available. I'm going to go ahead and say yes. And you click next. And then it asks, and this is very important. So it's data sharing consent. Consent. So to make Braille Blaster better, APH would like to understand more about users of Braille Blaster. If you agree, Braille Blaster will send some data about the features of the software you use, along with your answers to the following user survey. Uh, and so it's I am over eighteen and would like to help make Braille Blaster better by sharing data with APH. And so your options are yes or no. And so basically, I would love it if you said yes. But what it's doing is it's going to send anonymous data to APH about how you're using Braille Blaster. And part of this is where we're a very small team, we have to direct our efforts. Like, you know, the example of the top of Braille Blaster running really slow at startup. That has annoyed me for a year, but we didn't really know if it was happening to anybody else. We tested it with other folks and it, all those tests came back negative. So I needed a big group like this to, to confirm that yes, it is happening to other people. But we, we really have to prioritize what we work on um, because our team is so small. And so by knowing how you are using Braille Blaster, that'll give us some sense of where we need to put our time. So it's good to say yes, and it is all anonymous. So we'll click next. And if you do say yes, it then gives you a survey where you put in your job title. So you can say you're a teacher of the visually impaired, a gen ed teacher, O&M instructor, Braille transcriber, you know, and so on. And then you can, so I'll put Braille transcriber because that's what I am. And then you can put I am from, and then you pick your region. So Northeast, Southeast, Southwest, so on. Alaska, Hawaii, US territory, international. Uh, I'm gonna pick, you know, Northwest or no, Midwest. I forgot where I live. Uh, I'm going to pick Midwest. It's controversial, but people think, I think some people think Louisville's in the South. I think it's in the Midwest and I'll, I'll fight you over it. Um, and then you click finish when you're done and then Braille Blaster will run. And let's say you don't like the options you selected. Uh, you can actually go, once Braille Blaster starts up, you can actually go up to help privacy settings, and you can change everything. So you don't have to, um, it's not like you select those options and you're stuck with them forever. You can go in and you can turn off automatically checking for updates by unchecking this box that says automatically check for updates, or you can uncheck the box, I want to help make Braille Blaster better. And then you can also set up your error information and how errors will appear. So you've got some options there. So, you know, whether you've used Braille Blaster before, um, we'll go through kind of the basics as quickly as we can. And just kind of, this is going to be more of a like, teach a person to fish. So we're not going to be able to teach you how to do every single thing that Braille Blaster can do, because it can do quite a lot. It's a complicated program from that perspective. Um, but what we'll do is we'll try to give you, get you oriented so that if you've never used it before, you can get in there and play with it and learn more about it on your own. And then after we've done that for a bit, 
then we will spend the last uh, bit of the the webinar going over um, what's coming in the future. So the first thing is you'll open the program and you'll have these three blank views. Um, they're difficult to talk about without having some text on the screen. So I'm going to go ahead and put some text on the screen. This is a Braille Blaster. And nothing happens right away. We're back to the old behavior. So if you've been using V2 where it was translating as you typed, uh, we've reverted back to the old behavior. Part of that was a performance issue. Um, it was fine for most documents to translate as you typed, but for very, very large documents like textbooks, uh, it got to be very laggy, even on very fast computers. So it was in the best interests of everyone if we reverted back to the old behavior of not translating until you pressed enter or moved your cursor. So I just pressed enter. The font is super small by default. And that's probably pretty okay for most of the time, but it is not great uh, when you're doing a presentation. So to increase the font size, you can go up to view in the menu. Uh, there's a few options there. You can turn off the different views. Uh, you can adjust the toolbar. You can make the uh, icon smaller. Uh, and you can also turn off the Braille font, which will show the ASCII font instead. I just leave the Braille font on most of the time. Uh, I, I don't find ASCII to be that useful, but sometimes it can be. So that option's there. And then the main thing we care about is down at the bottom, increase font size, decrease font size. And so increase font size is control plus the equals sign or plus sign there. You don't have to hit shift, even though it does say the plus sign, which normally would require shift. And I just hit that a bunch until I made the font bigger so that hopefully folks are able to see it. So the other behavior that is different now is, so since we're not translating on the fly, um, now when you type, it will just keep going and going and going, and there is no right margin. So there's no right margin until you press enter. And then we translate and everything matches up. So like over here, you've got going, going is the beginning of both lines. And so that's one of the advantages of Braille Blaster is you've got this print view where you're doing all your work, you're typing all your text, you've got your Braille view where you see the translation live. And that's, kind of the big advantage of Braille Blaster is having these two views so that while you're working, you know, while I'm working with Braille Blaster, what I do is I keep my focus on the print view because I'm when you're working, your main focus is really those styles. So it's applying the styles. It's making sure everything's um, appearing correctly, your blank lines, your margins, that sort of thing. And then when you're proofreading, you can uh, flip over to the Braille view and make sure everything is as exactly as you expected. So that's kind of the chief advantage of Braille Blaster. So I've got the, the two items in there now. I'll go ahead and add a third item. If you've seen me uh, deliver a webinar about Braille Blaster before, this is a familiar aspect, but we've got a decent enough number of folks that have never been here before. Um, so we talked about formatting. So I've got three items. The default style of Braille Blaster is body text, which is a paragraph. Um, the big thing about Braille Blaster is automatic formatting. So we've brought back all the styles. And part of why we have brought back the styles is in, is in anticipation of eBraille. If you haven't heard about eBraille, I'll throw a link in the chat later, but it's daisy.org slash eBraille. And that's where you can learn more about it. But it's a new Braille file type that we're working on and that Braille Blaster is going to support. But we need all these styles. If you're not a Braille transcriber, um, some of these styles aren't going to make any sense to you. Um, that's where that Formats 2016 document comes in. But the main ones you're going to be want to be aware of are the basic category, 
So that's where you got your body text, your blocked text, your centered text, the heading category where you've got heading one, heading two, heading three, and the list category. So list one is just going to be your standard list. And then as you go up to, you know, two levels, three levels, you start to get additional. So you could have list 2A, list 2B, and so on. The question came in the chat, uh, can a visually impaired person use Braille Blaster? Absolutely. Uh, Braille Blaster is fully accessible. You know, multiple members of the Braille Blaster team are visually impaired and use screen readers. Um, we actually have, we tend to have bugs that only affect sighted people. So we've had uh, several bugs where we had an accessibility issue that didn't affect screen reader users, but did affect sighted people. So, you know, it's a mixed bag, but it, it is a fully accessible program. Uh, and if you do notice any issues, please report them, uh, because if you find it, it means we're not aware of it. All right. So those three categories are really the main three categories that you're probably, you know, if you're a casual user, that you're probably going to care about. But feel free to explore and try out the different categories. Um, so what I'll do now, I've got my three paragraphs. I'm going to go styles, list list one level on the second item. I don't need to highlight that item. I don't need to do anything. I just need to have my cursor on that item. So now I'm going list one, and then it automatically applies that style. And the moment that happens, it's gonna do several things. It's gonna put in blank lines. It's gonna put blank lines uh, before the item, after the item, and then it's gonna change the margins of the item. Those are all the rules from that formats 2016 document um, that are required for a list. And it's going to do this dynamically. Like I can go to this, this is a third item, and then I can apply that same style again. Like I can go styles, list, list one level, list one, or I can go styles, repeat last style. So the hotkey for that is control R on Windows. And so I can just click that, and that applies that same style again. And as it does, it changes the margins, it removes the blank line, uh, and then that um, gives us the formatting of a single list uh, with two items. Uh, Beth asked the question if we fixed some of the issues with translating to Nimeth code. Uh, and I'm glad you asked that, and it takes me back to the uh, the other question. So we're now on the latest lib Louie. So if you go to about Braille Blaster, we're now using the latest lib Louie. Um, if it's not, you know, if they put out a version recently, we may not have that, but we we have, we're no, we used to be very far behind and on our own branch. And now we're on the main lib Louie branch because lib Louie has made a lot of progress and has just gotten better and better. And so we want to support that. And so we have folks on our dev team. Uh, Ken, who is here, works with the folks at Lib Louie um, to help you know, improve it. And I think our translation is in many ways better than it's ever been before. I'm sure there's things that we aren't aware of uh, or that we need to work on, but I think it's gotten to a really good place. And we're happy to be a part of the Lib Louie mission if you're not familiar with Lib Louie, I encourage you to check it out. Um, Lib Louie is a open source Braille, uh, Braille translation service. And as a part of that, it is meant to work with Braille worldwide. So they have tables for UEB and for other languages. And getting extra additional contributors to it is always great. And yeah, thank you, Michael. We use MathCat for math, which has greatly helped with math transcription, both Nimeth and UEB technical. So I do think you'll notice improvements, uh, especially over 2.0. All right. So I've got my two list items. What are we doing on time? Um, I've got my two list items. I'm going to change this item to a heading. So I'll change it to a heading two. And then that changes the margins of that item. And it removes the blank line between it 
and the list items. So that's just kind of the basics. Uh, one other change I would like you to be aware of from V2, and this may change in a future version, but in V2, you could just activate the emphasis and then type, and it would automatically apply that emphasis to the text. Uh, in this version, uh, we're back to the older behavior where you need to type the text first and then highlight it, and then you can apply the emphasis uh, to the text. So that is a change that I want to make sure folks are aware of. All right. I'm not going to go through all of the settings, but just be aware, you know, we've got the settings page, you know, so page properties where you set up this, your page size and your lines per page, cells per page, uh, whether or not you're using Interpoint. Uh, translation settings is where you can set your code. So UEB, UEB uncontracted, uh, UEB plus Nemeth, Spanish, et cetera. Page numbers, we have a number of settings related to the location of page numbers. Most users aren't going to need to mess with anything here. This is more for advanced users, but you know, if you need to, it is available. And then we have a newer setting under format settings for predominant quote. Your options are none, single, and double. And this is related to a rule in Braille translation where your predominant quote, so double quotes or single quotes, gets translated as a single cell symbol, and the other one gets translated as a double, a two cell symbol. Um, it's, you know, if you're in the United States or Canada, it's primarily going to be double. If you're in the UK, it'll be single. Or if you're translating a book from the UK, it'll be single. So that's just a, a nice little option. The last setting that's important to go over is your embosser settings. And this is where you set up your embosser. It's a pretty straightforward process, but I don't have an embosser set up at the moment. So I would just use the add button, which brings up a little dialogue where you put in the name. So we'll call it page blaster since that was referenced earlier. And then you pick your embosser. I am at home where I do not have an embosser but I will pick my printer just as an example. And then you pick your manufacturer. So I'll pick APH. And then I will pick my model. My options are Pix Blaster and Page Blaster. And I'll pick Page Blaster. And then you click OK. So that's how you set up your embosser. And you can set up as many embossers as you need to. And then you can switch between them either from this dialog or during the act of embossing. When you're done, you can click OK. And now I can go to, I want to show, so file, save, or save as, will save your file as a BBZ. BBZ is a uh, proprietary file type for Braille Blaster. Um, but it's, it, it is a good way to save your work to open in Braille Blaster later. And you can also go to emboss. So if you go to emboss, It'll open a dialog where I've already set up the embosser. It's already got that there. And then I can just print from here with the OK button. One other feature I want to make sure you're aware of is the Braille preview. The Braille preview is like print preview, and it's a good way to check out your Braille and to proofread your Braille. Braille Blaster can open BRF and BRL files. Um, if you do open a BRF or a BRL, you can't edit it, but what it'll do is it'll open it in the Braille preview. So it can be a good way to review your file from the Braille preview. With that, let's go to another poll question, and then we'll get into a little bit more about Braille Blaster and where we're heading. Um, one moment. If you want to launch the next poll, I'll get the PowerPoint ready. All righty. We are on our next poll question. And the question is, what do you uh, what do you use Braille Blaster for? New documents, short documents, textbooks, technical materials like math, and other. And if you, you know, there are a lot of folks who have never used Braille Blaster, 
So don't worry about this poll question. You can skip this one. Uh, and if you are using other as your answer, uh, please put that in the chat and let us know in the chat which one you're using. So Denise asks in the chat, if you said our other already, but don't actually use Braille Blaster, that's fine. Um, and so Denise asks, I make quite a bit of flashcards. Is there any templates that allow embossing with uh, perforation lines? And is Braille Blaster able to produce any type of graphics? Um, so that's a good question. So first about graphics. Um, at the moment, we have very, very limited support for tactile graphics. And we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but it's so specific that I wouldn't even recommend using it at the moment. Um, so that's. So the, the short answer is no, we do not support any type of tactile graphics at the moment, but it's something we are working on adding. Um, for your other question, are there any templates that allow embossing with perforation lines? So for that, we don't have templates. So we don't have any kind of template to easily switch your settings. I could see how uh, a feature like that would be useful, but it's not something we have at the moment. So what you can do though, is you can set up your page margins um, to allow for those perforation lines, um, but there's not a lot we can do at the moment to make that easier or to make it easy to switch from having the lines to not having the lines. Um, one thing I would suggest is set up a document the way you need it to be set up for your perforation lines, save it, as you know perforation line template and then when you're ready to make a file that needs that open that original file and just change the braille you know you don't have to completely recreate the file from scratch just go in and you know put in the new words put ever put in whatever it is you you care about that would be the quickest way to switch back and forth between things Alrighty, and it looks like we have our poll results. So again, the question was, uh, what do you use Braille Blaster for? And 60% of you guys said new documents, 71% also added in that they do short documents, 26% for textbooks, 38% for technical materials, and 26% was other. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. And a lot of folks using it for new documents and short documents makes sense. We're really happy that folks are using it for textbooks. Um, Sarah asks about uh, getting it to number a set of math problems so that it will use the numeric indicator. Um, this So using the numeric indicator and the number and the punctuation indicator has been a longstanding um, issue that we need to address. Um, so that is something we're aware of. Part of it was all uh, part of it was my fault for misunderstanding the initial rules uh, for using UEB with Nemeth when the rules first came out. So we had some uh, design flaws that were my fault. Um, but we definitely need to circle back and address that problem because it should be something we can handle automatically. All right. So the next piece is support. So we talked about BRF and BRL. Let's also talk about the other file types we support. So at the very top of the list, I've opened, I've gone to file open, and it shows all the file types we support. It is a lot of files. Um, BBX and BBZ are the Braille Blaster file type. Now, one important thing to know about uh, Braille Blaster 2.1 is it's not backwards compatible with 2.0. So if you're in the middle of, of making a document in 2.0, go ahead and finish that document before you move over to 2.1. Now, the good news is you can actually have 2.0 and 2.1 installed, installed side by side. So it's not like you have to choose. You can go ahead and keep 2.0 installed and have 2.1, use 2.1 for new documents, use 2.0 for any old documents you may need to re-edit. Um, apologies for that, but uh, getting that uh, to work uh, would be a ton of work. 
uh, and we weren't really sure how useful it would be, especially since most folks will end up wrapping up their files and then just moving over. So be aware of that. We talked about BRF and BRL. Uh, we also support DOCX, EPUB, HTM, HTML, Markdown, open document files. And if you're not familiar with these file types, don't worry about it too much. Just know like the main ones are Microsoft Word files, EPUB files, HTML files from the web, and then TXT, and then Nimus XML and Nimus Zip. So Nimus XML, we talked about that at the top, but that's from the NIMAC. And then HTML's websites, and let's get into some examples. So a favorite example of mine to show is a docx file. And I'm actually going to go ahead and open it now. And that it's called analyzing the text. And it's a really basic file, but it shows a good way to use Braille Blaster. So this file, I've opened it from Word, and it is a super basic file, but you can make this file entirely in um, Microsoft Word and then open it and then not have to do any work inside Braille Blaster. So let's say you've never used Braille Blaster before. You don't want to learn how to use Braille Blaster. You're not interested in using Braille Blaster. That's totally fine. What you can do is you can go to Word which you probably are familiar with, and you can make your file there. So all I've done is add standard styles to this file. So we've got analyzing the text, that's a heading one. We've got the next item, site text evidence, that's just a paragraph. Then we have a list with some bold in it. Then we have a heading two for performance task, a heading three for writing activity. And then we have another couple paragraphs, well, a few paragraphs. That's all this is. So you can do this all in Word, save it, and then open it in Braille Blaster, and all that gets carried over. You don't have to do anything in Braille Blaster. So Cindy asks, any plans to open Adobe PDF? PDFs are a nightmare. They are the absolute worst. Um, so what I suggest is if you have a PDF, open it in Word. Their budget is way bigger than ours. And even they don't quite open PDFs correctly most of the time, but they do, they do well, some of the time, they do a pretty good job. You know, a very visual PDF, they'll mess up, but if you've got a good accessible text-based PDF, they'll do a pretty good job. Open it in Word, save it as a DocX, open that DocX in Braille Blaster. They, they you know, they're a, uh, you know, I think a trillion dollar company now. So their 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 ability to open PDFs is a bit better than ours. Um, hey, Willow, can I just clarify? You were over in Word, you were using those styles. And I think what you're saying is, is that when you open the document in Braille Blaster and you translate it, uh, it will maintain those styles or bring in some sort of formatting that is very important for Braille based on the styles that you've selected in Word. Like exactly. Braille Blaster is that intelligent. Yeah. Okay. So the heading one from Word is now a heading one in Braille, which is a centered heading. The paragraph is body text. So you got your three one. We've kept the uh, emphasis. Our list is still a list with all that emphasis. The heading two is a heading two, which is a cell five heading. Heading three is a cell seven. And then we've got our three paragraphs. And it automatically does the Braille page numbering. So there's not a lot you have to do here. Um, and this is a very effective way to utilize Braille Blaster and to benefit from Braille Blaster without having to learn how to use Braille Blaster. Um, we're running short on time. So sorry about that. Um, if we didn't get a chance to answer your questions, I want to direct you back to the contact us form. So please feel free to send us any questions through that. Um, I'll go ahead and put my email in the chat, especially since everybody already saw my emails. Um, so use my work email, uh, which is now wfree at aph.org. I changed my name to Willow Free. 
and I'll do my best to answer your questions from there. And let's launch our last poll question because I think we all want to know the answer to this. And I'll try to answer other questions in the chat while while that's going. So our last poll question is what all right. Yeah. Our last poll question is what transcription software do you use? Duxbury, Braille Blaster, Braille 2000, Tiger Software Suite, or other? And again, check all that apply. If you don't use any Braille transcription software, uh, you will make me very sad, but put that in the chat and then we'll at least know that you have not used transcription software and you're looking into using transcription software and you thought about Braille Blaster. And that, that'll, that'll make up for the fact you haven't used it. Yes, we still have materials in the Hive. We still have videos online about Braille Blaster. So there are a lot of ways to learn how to use Braille Blaster. And there's a lot of webinars out there still that you can find through the APH channel that are still relevant as well. All righty, it looks like we have some results. So what transcription software do you use? 61% uh, said Duxbury, 63% uh, said Braille Blaster, 18% uses Braille 2000, 33% uses Tiger Software Suite, and 5% uses other. That's great. We won. End that poll now. <laughs> um, so the main thing I want to make sure folks take away, thanks for that, is get the latest version. We're going to be putting out updates more frequently. Um, we're not going to we're not going to necessarily stick to a strict schedule. Um, our main focus is going to be just getting out new features and fixes, and as they are relevant and worthwhile, putting out new updates. So make sure you get on the latest. And then our goal over the next about a year or so is to be developing, our main goal will be developing the tools that are needed to create the eBraille file type. If you've not used eBraille, I'm going to direct you to the DAISY site. And I'm going to put that in the chat. And that is a great way to learn about eBraille and what it is we're trying to do. And it gives you all the information you need to get involved and to learn more. So that's gonna be our focus over the next year is just giving you the tools you need to be able to make eBraille. Um, and getting familiar with Braille Blaster now will help make that process easier, even though I do think it'll be ultimately a fairly easy process. I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and thank you for all the questions. And I'll try to answer questions in the chat as folks are, are heading out. Thank you all so much. Well, everybody, thanks for joining us today for today's webinar. I hope that you enjoyed our partner showcase. And like Willow said, if you have any questions, definitely feel free to fill out that contact form and we will definitely promptly be in contact with you guys. So have a great rest of your day and we'll see you soon. Willow, I, I will take the, uh, the transcript from the chat and I'll forward it over to you. I think we caught everything, but um, just in case. Um, and then uh, we'll do a follow-up email with the audience. So uh, I'll probably rendezvous with you as well as to what you'd like in that, um, in that, in that video. All right. Cool. I mean, in that follow up email. Yeah. All right. Great. Thanks, everybody. All right, everyone. Have a good one. All right. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Amanda. Bye.